the harder the character, the further away it is from me as an actor, the more it feels like I'm doing my job. I have no interest in playing anything akin to myself. Hi, I'm David Oyelowo, and this is the timeline of my career. Exactly, can we do that? Because we understand each other, we always have! Not anymore. Spooks came along at a time where I had just done uh, three years at the Royal Shakespeare Company. I'd had one season where I'd been in Antony and Cleopatra, Orinoco, and a play called Volpone. And then I had this huge moment in my career, which was uh, getting to play Henry VI at the Royal Shakespeare Company. But I hadn't really done anything on screen. And this show called Spooks came along, which was about MI5 spies. What I loved about it is that it had exactly the thing I had vowed to myself would be um, something I would always pursue in my career, which was to play roles that were not race specific. I had managed that with obviously getting to play the King of England in Henry VI, um, but when Spooks came along to effectively be Bond for the TV, as we liked to call it, was, a, was just a, a huge opportunity. Myself, Matthew McFadden and Keely Hawes, who played the leads in Spooks, we were all in our early 20s. And at that point in, um, uh, in British television, that just wasn't happening. Young people were not heading up these kind of shows. It was, it was stars who were more in their 40s, who were very reliable, constantly on TV. I think that's part of what was the success of the show because we literally treated every episode as if we were gonna get fired. Um, so we just went in and had as much fun as we could possibly have until everyone realized what they had done and, uh, and summarily let us go. This is your operation, Tom. Why are you wrecking it? Come after everything we've been through together, please. You owe this to us. No, 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 we couldn't do that here, not at Malago. Yeah. Why not? It's the president's hospital. He's bound to find out. We could do this discreetly, Tom. Tom. No! Because I did three seasons of Spooks and to be perfectly honest, I wanted to go on to be the lead. I wanted to uh, be front and center of that show and for whatever reason, um, they didn't see it the same way. And so I said, either, either put me front and center or give me the most epic death uh, possible. And uh, the latter is what happened. They gave me the epic death. And partly my thinking uh, around that was the show, Spooks has been such a big hit. I kept on having these great directors reach out to me and saying, we would love to work with you, but you're always busy uh, making Spooks. So the choice for me was either um, I should be more prominent in that show, or I, I wanted to go and call these directors bluff and see if they would still stick around when I was no longer on the show. And when I left the show, thankfully, uh, they were indeed there. And so The Last King of Scotland was one of the uh, first films I did after shooting Spooks with uh, James McAvoy and the incredible Forrest Whitaker. I'm of African descent myself, but it was the first film at that stage that I actually shot in Africa. And I think it was the only the second film ever shot in Uganda. They will believe you. Very wet, man. Yeah, you heard what Mom said. That mess right there happened down south. This could have been me. It happened down south. I got out of there so we could have us a better life. Right now, I'm working for the white man. Make things better for us. After The Last King of Scotland, you know, I did a couple of other films, but also Spooks uh, did really well here. In, in America and so it became a good excuse to come out here and see if there were going to be opportunities and my wife and I started coming um, just speculatively to see uh, what, what, what might be out here and uh, we ended up moving in 2007 and about two, three months after moving this script Selma hit my doormat. That led to a whole journey um, that eventually led to Lee Daniels. Um, who uh, came on board to, to direct that film. I first read Selma in 2007, Lee Daniels came on board with Selma in 2010, and then for a myriad of reasons we couldn't get 
Selma off the ground, but we uh, formed this really quite incredible bond, and that's what led to him um, casting me in the in the Butler. When I had played Henry the Sixth. Um, it was Henry VI parts one, two, and three, and I had experienced what it is to go from being a teenager in those plays to also being an older man. And so when the butler came along and presented the same kind of opportunity and challenge, but on film, it was one that felt very natural to me to, to jump into because I knew that um, playing age is not just about makeup, it's about a state of mind. That was something I had learnt playing Henry VI. Um, and so it was a no-brainer that I was going to play this guy from the age of 18 through to 65 or whatever it was. But that is less often the case on film as, as can be the case in, in theatre. And so, unknown to me, Lee Daniels had actually cast someone to play the younger version of Lewis Gaines, the character I play in The Butler. And I had no idea. We, we, I turned up, we were doing the um, camera test, um, as is often the case before you go on to, to shoot the film. And I just did what I assumed I would do, which is to play my 18-year-old self. And then we put makeup on and, and we also saw that I could play my 60-something-year-old self. And it wasn't until after the camera test, I found out that an actor who had been hired was then let go. Um, because I didn't realize I had effectively been auditioning again to play the younger version of myself when we did the camera test. So that was a relief. Not so much for that poor actor who had, had to be let go, but uh, I was very keen to play the full arc of the character and I'm thankful I got to do that. We march in this country for our rights. Today, we march to free the people of South Africa. A law that says you have to get up every morning at 7 o'clock, put on your clothes and your makeup and your costume jewelry. Up until this point in my career, I had had the opportunity to work with Forrest Whitaker in The Last King of Scotland. I'd also seen an actor like Daniel Day-Lewis in um, Lincoln. I saw these two magnificent titans of acting immersing themselves so deeply in their characters that it was impossible to discern who they actually were as people themselves on set. And Nightingale was the first time that I made the choice to stay in character the whole time. Partly because when I did The Last King of Scotland, to be perfectly frank, being around Forrest was tough because he was playing a Ugandan dictator. And so um, making small talk with him on that set was not something that was going to be happening. And even though it was fantastic for the film, it was difficult for the crew and the rest of the cast. And so, so if I was going to do that, it felt like Nightingale was the perfect opportunity to try it out. I didn't have to be mean to other members of the cast because they weren't there and it gave me an opportunity to see if this is something that works for me. And the thing I couldn't have anticipated is that playing that character, staying in character for the three weeks, four weeks of the shoot and the thing that it gave me is it meant I never second-guessed any choices I made on screen. And that's an incredibly releasing thing to, to not be in your own head as to whether you're making the right choices for the character. And so it gave me the blueprint for playing other intense characters that I, that I went on to play beyond doing Nightingale. You want to ruin everything? Fine! This isn't over yet. I know all your hiding places. And on the rare occasions that they face trial, they are freed by all white juries. All white because you can't serve on a jury unless you are registered to vote. One of the challenges for Selma during these seven years before it got made was that we were still in a time where there was this narrative, this really insidious narrative in Hollywood that black doesn't travel. 
Um, so it was a film that wouldn't do well internationally. It was a film that exhibited black pain, so black people wouldn't want to see it. And it was a film that maybe made white people feel guilty, so white people wouldn't want to see it. So that, that was a narrative. Uh, we kept on being told that the film should be made for about 25% less of the budget than it actually needed to get made. So Lee just couldn't find a way to get this film made. That's why I went on to do the films The Paperboy and The Butler with him instead. But in the meantime, I had done a film called Middle of Nowhere with Ava DuVernay. Um, that came about because I was on my way to do reshoots for a film called Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Um, and I sat down next to a guy who happened to be watching Spooks on his iPad. And he looked at me, looked at his iPad, looked at me again, paused his iPad and said, is this you I'm watching on my iPad? I said, oh yeah, that's me. He said, oh, okay, you're an actor. Give me some advice. I've been asked to put some money into a film called Middle of Nowhere. Do you think that's a good idea? I said, well, send me the script. I'll tell you if it's a good idea. He sent me the script. I loved it so much that I flipped to the front of the script and it said Ava DuVernay and her cell number was on it. I called her when I got off the plane having done my reshoots and I said, I've just read your script, it's incredible, can I be in it? And Ava told me that I was actually on her list of people she wanted for this, but she thought I would never do it because I do these bigger movies. Anyway, we went on to do this film, we made it for $200,000. Um, and Ava ended up winning Best Director at Sundance. I knew doing that film that I had been in the midst of a genius. And I went on to find out that her dad was actually from Lowndes County, which is the county between Selma and Montgomery, which is where the Selma March took place. I thought, this is the person to direct this film. I took her name to both Pathé and Plan B, who were the production companies on Selma because I had got cast by Lee Daniels. Even though Lee moved on, I stuck with the project. They said, well, who, who is Ava DuVernay? I said, she just won Best Director at Sundance. Okay, what's this film you guys did? Middle of nowhere. How much did you make it for? $200,000. $200,000, David, this is a $20 million movie. We can't give uh, uh, that to someone who's made this small film. I said, uh, 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 see the film. They saw the film. They agreed with me that this was an incredibly talented lady. But... Again, it was the budget. The genius thing Ava said, which really got things moving, is she said, okay, give me a budget. Whatever budget you give me, I will back into that number. Whatever money there is to make it, I will make it for that. So it eroded all the excuses not to make the movie. In the meantime, I had done The Butler with with Oprah Winfrey as my mother. I had played her son. That was the film I did with Lee Daniels instead. I told her about my ambition of playing Dr. King. She said, I truly believe that is part of your destiny and I will do everything I can to help you achieve it. So even though Ava came on board to make the film, we were still struggling to get it off the ground. I called Oprah. I said, I'm gonna call you on that thing you said. I need you to be a producer on this film. She said, what does that mean? I said, I just need you to be part of this film. She came on board. And that is ultimately what gave Paramount the confidence to make Selma in 2014, seven years after I had first read the script. When you think about the fact that I met Ava, who has become such a huge figure in my life personally, but a, but a, a huge uh, person in terms of my career, I only met her because I sat next to the right guy on the right plane at the right time. I would never probably have met her. Literally, if I sat in the row behind this guy, I probably would never have met her and Ava would never have directed Selma, which of course would be a tragedy. I say no more. I had done studio movies, but playing smaller roles, you know, Jack Reacher, um, The Help, um, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I had, I had not yet played a sort of leading role 
um, in, a, in, a, in a studio movie. Even Selma sort of had an indie vibe to it. Queen of Cartway was very much being made by, by Disney. You know, as I had said to you before, I'd done The Last King of Scotland, which was one of the first films, which was the, the first film I had made in Africa. Um, and, and that was a huge source of pride for me, but it was about a dictator, which is, you know, you could argue is part of the, the negative side of Africa that is of course true, but is more uh, prevalent in terms of what we see around the world. What you'd definitely never seen before in a studio movie was an 11 year old chess prodigy who was growing up in a slum, but who was a genius. Um, and so that was something that really spoke to me, especially as I had, you know, I'm one of three boys in terms of my parents. Uh, they had three sons. I had at that point three sons myself, and then I had a daughter and my heart kind of exploded. I mean, I love my sons deeply, but you know, to suddenly have a, a, a daughter was this, earth shattering thing. And so Queen of Cartway, when I read the script, really I made that as a love letter to my daughter because the film is about a young girl recognizing and realizing and being supported in being everything she can be, fulfilling the total and the totality of her, of her potential. And that, of course, is something I want for my daughter. And this film illustrated that so beautifully. God, is this heaven? No. Heaven is a bit higher. That race must have no bearing on equality and justice. United Kingdom was a project for me that just meant so, so much. Um, partly because from a representation point of view, I had never seen a leader, a king, a man of integrity who was a leader of his people of this nature on film. But what I loved about the story of Saretse Kama and Ruth Williams is that it was just a love story, a fairy tale like love story that just happened to be a true story. Um, and I was very, very adamant that it would get told and get told right. And like Selma, it was another film that took seven years from the first time I was handed a book called Color Bar um, to us actually getting um, a United Kingdom. Selma really taught me um, what a, being a producer is. And basically you roll your sleeves up and you do not stop until you get that thing made. And part of that is wheeling out your Rolodex. And, um, you know, I've done that on all the films I've, I've gone on to produce. Um, and uh, United Kingdom was definitely a case in point. I had done uh, Jack Reacher uh, with Rosamund Pike. We'd become great friends doing that, that, that film. And so, yeah, I made a phone call. Um, the, the thing I did is I, I actually didn't send her the script, which is what you would normally do. I just sent her an image of Soretze Karma and Ruth Williams. And she emailed me right back saying, I'm looking at these two people and I'm crying and I don't know why, tell me more. Um, and um, that was pretty much how uh, Rosamund came on board and Amma Asante who ended up directing the, the film and you know having those two ladies on board uh, really was um, was the rocket fuel we needed to get the film done. I love this land but I love my wife. Imagine what it must be like to see the whole world to sail the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Earlier in my career, there were opportunities that simply were not being afforded black actors. It's actually why my dad was really resistant to me being an actor. He just didn't see enough evidence of success. And so he was really concerned about me choosing this as a career. But as you know, during the 20 years or so of my career thus far, you know, I have now watched as myself and, and other actors, some of who are younger than me, are now being afforded opportunities, the likes of which were not there 
before. Come Away is an example of the kind of film that I just simply would not have been offered earlier on in my career. It's a film that uh, wonderfully and imaginatively uh, brings together the, the worlds of Alice from Alice in Wonderland and Peter from Peter Pan and, and makes them brother and sister. And Brenda Chapman approached me uh, to play their father. And in doing that, it was evident that both these iconic characters, fictional characters, were going to be played by kids of color, kids who look like me when I was growing up, kids who look like my kids now. And that was just um, a beautiful thing to see and be a part of. So, you know, there was between the very imaginative concept, the great script, the, the fact that I was being approached with a, a role of Alexa, which I hadn't in the past, there were just so many reasons to say yes. It's a bit of a theme in, in, in my career, which is a, an odd discussion with my wife that I, I, I keep on choosing these, uh, these uh, on-screen wives for myself. Um, but uh, Angie and I had been uh, uh, friends for quite a while. We'd met at a, at a birthday party and uh, we, we really connected over the fact of having a bunch of kids. She has six, I have four. And we would occasionally have these play dates with all 10 of them running around um, causing havoc. You know, I got to really see her as a mother, but you know, uh, funnily enough, Nightingale, which we talked about earlier on, was a film that she saw and she expressed jealousy at the fact that, you know, I get to do independent films and that's something that rarely comes her way. So between um, seeing her as this mother, knowing that she very rarely gets to play mothers and her saying that she never gets um, offered independent film, I basically called her bluff when this uh, uh, script came my way. They saw my passion for it and I came on board as a producer and I approached Angie and I said, okay, I'm offering you a, uh, an independent film where you get to play a mom. What, what, what do you think? And within four days of approaching her, she was on board the project. As an actor, I, I think of myself primarily as a storyteller, which is why, you know, whether it's producing, directing, writing, or acting, they are all headed in the same direction, which is basically getting a story told. I've come to recognize just how powerful a tool it is for shifting culture. And, and as a black person, you know, who has faced prejudice and who looks at the world and, and sees both its beauty and how it can sometimes be beastly, storytelling is more to me than just entertainment. It is culture, um, it is history, it is education. And so to be part of that is something I, I hugely value and, and don't take for granted. So whether I'm part of telling the story in front of the camera or behind the camera, it's always about its cultural impact for me because I know that that is something that is the case whether we like it or not, it's just a reality.